Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Karim McSherry, and I'm an attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, the original plan for this panel was we were going to start out by, we're going to do an Ask EFF panel, and we were going to start out actually by talking a little bit about what we've been doing over the past year, um, you know, what our major concerns are. But it turns out that we're going to need to change things up a little bit. And actually what we're going to do is talk a little bit about what we've been doing for the past 24 hours, um, which has been part of what we do all the time, <laughs> but uh, in a very shortened time frame. So for those of you who aren't aware, um, what we're going to do for the next, well, however long it takes, um, but for the first part of our talk, is actually have a press conference um, to talk to you about an event that's happened over the past 24 hours here at DEF CON that we've been involved in and these fine young men have been involved in. Um, so I announce that now because if anyone doesn't want to hear about it, if you're not in the press or you have other things you'd rather be doing with your time, take a few minutes to leave because we're actually going to need a few minutes more from you because we're having a little bit of technical difficulty over here. Uh, so we'll be right with you in a second. And uh, I think it will be worth waiting for. Thanks. Second hour of our, so in an hour's time, I'm going to have a, a PDF file for a talk on a public Actually, web server. Um, okay, so I think we've worked out our technical difficulty. I'm going to hand over the mic in a second to my colleague, Kurt Offsall. Um, I just want to say one more thing about what we're planning to do today. We actually do have a few things that we really did want to you know, talk to you about today and make sure that um, we had a, a good full chance to do a good back and forth um, other than the issue that we're about to discuss right now. So um, after this press conference, um, my co a couple of my colleagues here are going to come up and, and talk about some important other recent work that EFF's been doing. And we will still do the Ask the EFF um, discussion in the breakout room um, after this two-hour session. So just so you kind of have a general idea of what we have in mind, we'll see how it goes. And uh, now I'm going to shut up and hand over the podium to Kurt Opsahl. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, you have three hours of us coming forward, two in here, one in the Q&A room, so hopefully that'll be enough to answer all your questions. But we wanted to start uh, the session today uh, with something that has happened over the last uh, 24 hours. And I'm going to start out by uh, reading uh, our, our uh, press release that we just gave out. Um, so here it goes. Uh, MIT students gagged by federal court judge. EFF backs researchers forced to cancel presentation on transit fare payment system. Three students at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology were ordered this morning by a federal court judge to cancel their scheduled presentation about vulnerabilities in Boston's transit fare payment system, violating their First Amendment rights to discuss their important research. EFF represents Zach Anderson, RJ Ryan, and Alessandro Caiza, who were sent to present their findings Sunday at DEF CON here. However, the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority sued the students in MIT in the United States District Court in Massachusetts on Friday, claiming the students violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act by delivering the information to conference attendees that could be used to defraud the MBTA of transit fares. This morning, District Judge Douglas P. Woodlock meeting in a special Saturday session, ordered the trio not to disclose for 10 days any information that be, could be used by others to get free subway rides. 
quote, we wanted to share our academic work with the security community and had planned to hold withhold a key detail of our results so that a malicious attacker could not use our research for fraudulent purposes, said Anderson. Quote, we're disappointed that the court is preventing us from presenting our findings even with that safeguard, end quote. Vulnerabilities in magnetic stripe and RFID card payment systems implemented by many urban transit systems are generally known. The student research applied this information to the specific case of Boston's Charlie Card and Charlie Ticket, and the project earned an A from renowned computer scientist and MIT professor, Dr. Ron Rivest. The court relied on a federal law aimed at computer intrusions by in, in issuing its order, holding that even discussing the flaw at a public conference constituted a transmission of information that could harm the fair collection system. Quote, this court's order is an illegal prior restraint on legitimate academic research in violation of the First Amendment, said EFF Civil Liberties Director Jennifer Granick. The court adopted an interpretation of the statute that is blatantly unconstitutional, equating discussion in a public forum with computer intrusion. Security and the public interest benefit immensely from the free flow of information, uh, of ideas and information on vulnerabilities. More importantly, squelching research and scientific discussions won't stop the attackers. It will just stop the public from knowing that these systems are vulnerable and from pressuring the companies that develop and implement them to fix security holes." End quote. This case is part of the EFF's Code of Rights project, which was launched this week to protect programmers and developers from legal threats hampering their cutting-edge research. EFF will seek relief for the researchers in the courts. So that's our press release, and now I'm going to read uh, from our, uh, sorry, from the court's temporary restraining order. Um, skip some of the, the introductory materials. They define some terms. Uh, but I think you'll, you'll get the idea, is the MIT undergrads are hereby enjoined and restrained in accordance with Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 65B2 from providing program, information, software code, or command that would assist another in any material way to circumvent or otherwise attack the security of the FAIR media system. And that order was entered uh, at 1.30 p.m. Uh, in Massachusetts. So that's, uh, that's some of the brief summary, and let me give more of a, a longer form uh, a sense of the story uh, that, uh, that happened here. Is, uh, uh, the first notice that uh, the MBTA provided that they were going to the court was after they had gone to the court and gone uh, yesterday afternoon, late Friday, um, uh, East Coast time, and did not provide notice until they had already sent their lawyers with papers to the court to file their complaint, to file their motion for a temporary restraining order. Nevertheless, the court did not grant the uh, uh, temporary restraining order that day, but instead ordered a hearing uh, first thing uh, uh, this morning, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, uh, East Coast time, 7 a.m. Uh, local time. Uh, so uh, we uh, we got involved. We agreed to represent uh, the MIT students uh, as part of our Coders Rights Project and part of our dedication to defending uh, free speech and the ability to uh, be able to talk freely about security vulnerabilities and enhance the security of computer systems by being able to talk about uh, the issues that are raised. Um, we, uh, we worked uh, uh, all night uh, trying to uh, prepare for the hearing. Uh, it is a uh, very, uh, very short notice. Uh, but we uh, we uh, prepared we could. Uh, a big uh, thanks to uh, DEFCON, who was extraordinarily helpful in uh, in making that uh, uh, possible by giving us secure uh, connections, space to work in, use of some printers. Uh, there were people uh, who were uh, helpful to us all night long, uh, sacrificing some of their uh, their evenings when there were plenty of uh, parties to go to and things to do on a, on a Friday night at DEF CON, and so we really appreciate that. 
um, and uh, uh, it's been great uh, working with these guys. Uh, they were also uh, with us uh, every step of the way, uh, working hard to h help us understand what was going on, explain them th their stories, and it was been really great working with you guys. Um, Nevertheless, the hearing was held uh, this morning uh, at, at approximately uh, 11. Actually, at 11, the court uh, said that it wanted to take a few moments to, uh, to read the papers, uh, so it didn't get started till a, a little bit later. Uh, then, uh, then we had the hearing. Uh, we made our, made our arguments. Uh, the other side made their arguments. Uh, and uh, the court ultimately came to a very, very wrong conclusion. And I just want to sort of uh, emphasize one aspect of, of the uh, wrongness of the conclusion is this was about the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which uh, those of you, if you're here uh, on an EFF uh, panel, you may be following these issues and know that that is a computer intrusion statute. And what the, uh, uh, the relevant portion of the statute uh, speaks of is causing the transmission of a program, information, code, or command uh, to a protected computer. So the statute on its face appears to be uh, discussing sending code, programs, or similar types of information to a computer and does not appear to contemplate somebody who is giving a talk to humans. Nevertheless, the court disagreed with that interpretation and uh, believed that uh, the uh, act of uh, giving a presentation uh, to a group of humans uh, was covered by the computer fraud, uh, computer intrusion statute. We believe this is wrong. Uh, there, there were uh, some other issues in the case that I think some people might find interesting. If you uh, uh, read the complaint, uh, uh, it uh, suggests that a uh, magnetic stripe card is a computer for purposes of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, there are, there are uh, uh, many problems with such a, an interpretation. Um, so we are, are very uh, disappointed in this temporary restraining order. For those of you who are a little unfamiliar with the, uh, uh, how the, that aspect of the legal system works, uh, when you go to a court to uh, obtain an order telling somebody not to do something and you need it in short order, the vehicle is a temporary uh, restraining order. And those are uh, very um, short-term orders uh, and uh, are uh, uh, usually replaced or not replaced if they were improvidently granted. Uh, by a preliminary injunction, and then a long time later, after trial, uh, you might consider uh, an injunction. So this uh, uh, temporary restraining order, and uh, it reflects uh, the court's uh, view that uh, they believe that the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority uh, was likely to succeed on the merits. As we've just discussed, we, we think that's actually not the case. Um, Unfortunately, however, this, this order, uh, which I just read to you, uh, creates a very, very difficult situation uh, when the court is considering uh, such a broad definition of information and is prohibiting the providing information that could assist another in any material way to circumvent or otherwise attack. That is a very, very difficult definition to deal with and it makes it impossible to go on with the talk. So unfortunately, uh, as a result of this uh, order, uh, the uh, uh, talk uh, scheduled for, uh, otherwise scheduled for one o'clock tomorrow, uh, will not uh, be able to go on. Uh, we are anticipating uh, appealing this decision and uh, look forward to having uh, the rights vindicated. But in the meantime, we're very disappointed. All right, thank you. Should we take questions? So we, we can take some questions. And here, I'll stand up. We ask that if people want to ask questions, they go to the, to the microphone. Uh, what, uh, what bearing, if any, does this TRO have on the uh, presentation materials that have been distributed with the DEF CON CD? As a re <laughs> uh, 
Uh, as a result of this TRO, uh, we will not be able to uh, discuss the, the substance of those materials. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm with MIT Student Newspaper, The Tech. Just a quick question. Was the talk that was going to be given going to contain any new material orally that was not already available in writing? Much of the material that was uh, planned to be presented is, is material that's known. It, it is, there are known flaws to uh, the Massachusetts Transportation Authority's uh, security system. And some of that has been covered in the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and much work has, has been done on this in, in other um, forums. Um, so, uh, uh, it was never the intention of, of the students to uh, provide sufficient information so someone could break into the system and defraud the uh, Transportation Authority. Um, that's our, our answer for now. I'm just curious because of the timing of this situation that the TRO is as effective as almost a permanent injunction until next DEFCON. So if we go back in court or you go back in court and thank you for your work um, and you win, maybe you could uh, convince them that the remedy would be for the Massachusetts Bay Transportation to pay for next year's DEFCON for all attendees since this year we got ripped off. <laughs> Thank you for that excellent suggestion. Yes. I'm, I'm wondering if the Transportation Authority gave any legitimate excuses for why they waited until now to file. Obviously, it seems very slimy to do that when you have very little chance to defend yourself. I, your presentation was up there two months ago, so it's not like this should be new to them. Thank you for making that point. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is there anything to stop someone familiar with these techniques from, say, coming up with a last-minute uh, presentation using materials on the CD? And, uh, well, we cannot yeah. discuss the, the substance of the well, you CD have and certainly could not give any information, program, code, or, or what have you that could enable somebody to do um, anything to the transit fare system. I'm wondering if you can uh, just answer some questions that uh, I have about the, the claim that there was never any intention to uh, enable other people to hack the, the T card system. Specifically, uh, some of the slides suggest, you know, showing how to hack into the, the system. And of course, uh, an earlier presentation uh, or, or, you know, kind of teaser for this thing specifically said, you know, want fr uh, free subway rides for life. You're saying that you ha never had any intention, but that doesn't seem to square with some of the written materials that have been released about this. Can you can you kind of address that a little bit, please? Yeah. At, at the end of the day, there was not an intention to provide uh, sufficient details in order to enable somebody to walk out of that presentation and be able to do the tax. Some key details will be held back uh, so that. Uh, 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 it was not a sort of a standalone uh, uh, material. I can't discuss the substance of, of, of the slides, um, and uh, but just please understand that uh, you know, rhetoric aside, that the that the the attention was to provide an interesting and useful talk, but not one that would uh, enable people to uh, uh, defraud the Massachusetts uh, Bay Transit Authority. You said that you had no indication until Friday afternoon that the T was planning to file this injunction, right? The first so, notice uh, received about the complaint and uh, motion for uh, a restraining order was provided Friday afternoon. Okay, so my understanding is that the students and Dr. Rivest and the MBTA and MIT lawyers all met on August 5th and discussed something, at, at which meeting the students assured the MBTA that they didn't mean to cause them any harm. But what did happen at that meeting? Did they show them the vulnerability? Did they show them the code? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll speak into the microphone. How about um, so uh, there, there? There was a meeting uh, held on on Monday, um, and uh, the uh, students uh, came out of that meeting understanding that uh, a, a, a situation had been uh, an understanding had come to, and a situation had been resolved. 
um, and uh, uh, that that appears uh, to have turned out not not to be the case. So on Monday, the T said, we're not going to sue you. And on Friday, an injunction appeared. Well, it was certainly the understanding coming out of the Monday meeting that the situation had been resolved, that, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, it wasn't that they made a you know, affirmative promise not to sue, but rather that they seemed to have their concerns satisfied and that uh, they, 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 it seemed like a friendly meeting, and that uh, uh, you know, when you when you leave meetings with people, you don't ordinarily say, "And oh, by the way, I'm not going to sue you." Um, so, you know, but you you can still often will leave a meeting with the understanding that the other people aren't going to sue you. I'm looking for a silver lining here, uh, particularly about the RFID devices. Uh, should this come to trial? Would that definitely des decide whether a RFID actually constitutes a computer or not? Um, well, so uh, in, in addition to asserting that the uh, that the mag stripe uh, was a computer for purposes of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, they also asserted that the RFID-based uh, FAIR uh, system was also a computer, uh, and then uh, that the FAIR system as a whole uh, was a computer. Uh, so I mean that that is as an issue. I don't know if you know if it went forward, uh, whether uh, that would end up being a, a critical issue that would get decided by a court. It is a critical issue. Thank you. When were the open source tools taken offline? The uh, the open source uh, tools. I think you're referring to the website. Yes. The website never had the tools. No tools were put up uh, pending the resolution of you know the the uh, situation uh, with the transit authority. Uh, that situation ultimately did not get resolved until a, a court order, uh, and so no tools were ever up on that uh, location. Without going into the details, were those tools also applicable to the Dutch transportation system? Uh, I don't I don't know about that. And do they know? I don't think we can really discuss the tools, but, um, you know, they haven't been released. Let uh, me rephrase it. Could you, um, could you do a similar talk um, about a similar subject uh, on the Dutch transportation system? <laughs> Uh, all, all I'll say is that the, the TRO is, is specific to the Massachusetts fair uh, transit system. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, Dean Takahashi, Adventure Beat. Um, a couple of questions. Um, so is First, First Amendment defense is part of your defense here? Absolutely. Okay. The, there's a First Amendment right in code. There's a First Amendment right in instructional speech. Courts have found that the First Amendment covers these things outside of uh, traditional speech like political speech. And so um, uh, we believe that this is a, a protected speech activity. This is telling when you discuss uh, security issues, if you are telling the truth, that should be something which is protected at the core of the First Amendment. If you are truthfully telling the world about a dangerous situation, uh, and a situation which is dangerous not because the, the security researcher exposes the vulnerability, it's dangerous because the person who made the product, the company that made the product, made the vulnerability. And so this should be uh, core speech. And then the second question is, uh, I understand that there are people who have the CDs who are in the process of posting the paper on the internet. Uh, and uh, does the order cover these people uh, who, are, who are doing this? And what's let the consequence me, for those people? Let me just uh, re read from the order. <laughs> it says that the MIT undergrads are hereby enjoined and I'm going to read the, the, the definition. <laughs> the term MIT undergrads means the defendants, uh, and it names uh, these three uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, and all persons in active concert or participation with any of them. Thanks. 
So my question is, um, we've seen obviously some problems in, in Holland and also in the UK regarding transit systems. These are all based on the same flawed technology. Do you expect to see uh, similar responses from other uh, US-based MyFair technology that's used here in the US? So uh, the MyFair technology has been implemented in cities uh, uh, all over the place. And uh, some excellent work from uh, security researchers uh, have exposed uh, issues with the MyFair technology. This has come to a head uh, in the Netherlands, where there was a, a lawsuit to try and uh, 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 squelch some uh, security vulnerability exposure. Uh, on a version of, of my fair, uh, the Dutch court ultimately uh, did did not squelch that speech, and, and uh, uh, the Dutch court agreed that the responsibility for the security vulnerability lay with the company and not the uh, people announcing the exploit. Uh, there have been problems identified with uh, other uh, transit systems all over, and hopefully this is a, a, a time for that industry, instead of spending as much time trying to stop people from talking about about the security of their system, to spend a little bit more time improving the security of their system. Um, I was wondering if you, you, you can't talk about the, uh, the stuff that's in your paper or whatever. Are you allowed to talk about the court filings filed by the MBTA that describe specific attacks against their own system? Um, I think that, uh, you know, if there's, uh, the docket, I guess, uh, uh, speaks for itself, and I, I can't, I'm not going to comment on that. Okay. Ira Victor with Data Security Podcast. Are there other cases cited by the judge or the plaintiffs where the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was used in a way uh, similar to this uh, this uh, case? No, not not one. Not one was cited. Uh, the, the order itself has no citation. Uh, there there wasn't much discussion of of court cases. Uh, during the the argument, uh, there the argument was uh, recorded on audio. I hope the court uh, makes that audio uh, available, uh, and certainly uh, it, we would have uh, no objection if somebody tried to get a copy of that uh, that audio if the court was willing to release it. And and a follow up: Do you know approximately how many other cities are using this uh, similar technology? Um, in, in the United States, in, in the United I, States. I don't know that number offhand, but... Uh, uh, do one of the students maybe know, and, and would they be allowed to comment on that question? I would say look at the slides. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to understand why the judge issued this temporary restraining order. Uh, if you read the argument, or sorry, if you read the injunction he actually filed, he says two things. First of all, he says, for the sake of the security of the computer system, I hereby provide this injunction. And second of all, he says, I've given most of my explanations for this orally. Could you explain exactly what he said at that hearing? Because we don't have it in paper. Um, so uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why I think that uh, uh, it is important to be able to see the, uh, or hear the recorded uh, hearing, uh, especially the part in which the judge gave his order. Uh, one of the core uh, values of our judicial system is the openness of the judicial si system. Hearings are, are presumed to be open, and the reason for it is so people can understand uh, what a judge is doing, and it's a check against uh, error. Uh, to uh, to allow uh, uh, or require that these hearings be held in the open, people can evaluate what uh, what the judge said. So hopefully that that material can be uh, that that recording can be made available. Um, we had to participate telephonically. Uh, it was a long way to Boston, and we didn't have uh, uh, a jet handy. So uh, uh, you know that that was a limiting factor in being able to uh, uh, participate, uh, but nevertheless we, we were able to participate and that was that was great. Um, and it seemed that the, the court um, had some interesting interpretations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse uh, Act. Uh, it, it felt that, uh, that the uh, transit authority was likely to succeed on the merits, that uh, the harm to the authority uh, would be high, while the harm to uh, uh, putting a prior restraint on the speech of uh, security researchers uh, was not that high. Um, that uh, uh, the balance of, of interest uh, favored giving the injunction. So those were some of the, the reasons that were uh, discussed. Uh, Kim Zetter with Wired News. 
In the uh, meeting that the three students had a week ago with the uh, transit authorities, there was an FBI agent present. I'm wondering if you can tell me if you're aware of whether or not there's an ongoing inv FBI investigation? Uh, it, uh, it's my understanding that they are not the, uh, the subjects of an FBI investigation. Um, if this is a temporary restraining order and it expires, say, next Tuesday, is there anything preventing the students from publishing their materials on next Wednesday? Um, well, the, the, the next step uh, with a temporary restraining order is to determine whether or not it turns into a preliminary injunction. Uh, and so uh, it's not um, – that will require another hearing, another argument, another chance to – to raise uh, the arguments that uh, uh, are, are, you know, we believe to be meritorious, uh, but uh, uh, it will not just expire without uh, an opportunity for the transit authority to reassert its, its arguments. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, you stated that the audio recording of the uh, court hearing uh, would be very beneficial to be uh, posted publicly. Will you, the EFF, be attempting to obtain it and uh, publish it yourselves? Uh, we may. We have not uh, looked into that, but uh, uh, certainly we have no, no objection to uh, uh, the members of the public and the press trying to uh, get a hold of that in furtherance of, of their uh, rights to understand how the court system works. Okay. Are, is there anything keeping – so you would support someone else uh, and you'll look into doing it yourself or – yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to understand how to get around, or not get around, but to avoid this in future DEF CONs, if some of us are security researchers and we have something that might be controversial, were the students served at the last second? Or, I mean, I noticed their lawyers went in at the last, you know, minute and made it so that there really isn't any chance for any appeals or anything. If I mean, can you hide right before DEF CON before you do this, or what? Well, uh, as a general rule, trying to uh, uh, get around the legal system by hiding from service is, is not the best way forward. Uh, you know, it, I, I think that the system didn't work here, but generally the system is useful, uh, that uh, courts actually are uh, a place where uh, – more often than not, a lot more often than not, you can go and present your legal arguments, you can talk reasonably to a judge, and you can get a good result. Uh, and so you know, we try and work within the court system uh, and try and shape the law, make the law a better place so that in the future people don't have to hide from it. And so it's a, if it's a system where the law is bad and you're hiding from it, that is a much worse system than where the law is good and you don't have to hide from it. Another specific question on that would be, okay, so if you didn't, if you discovered a vulnerability in X, Y, Z, in company A, B, C, if you leave out the company, so I understand that when you want to present things here for credibility, you have to give enough evidence that yeah, this is real, but nobody wants to give everything away, so anybody can take the CD and everybody can go do it. So there's that nice line. But if you leave out specifics, would that make it safer in the future for researchers trying to present um, here? Well, one thing I, I, I would recommend to people in the future, if you are uh, facing a, uh, a situation, um, we you know we have announced uh, the the uh, coders uh, rights project uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, this is something that we are uh, dedicated to. EFF has long been a friend of the security research community, but uh, th this project is designed to enhance that. And so contact us. Contact us as early as possible. Possible, uh, so that we can help uh, either uh, walk you through these issues ourselves or help you find some counsel that will uh, so that the situation uh, that you individually are, are facing can be addressed in the best possible way. So will subsequent hearings be uh, before the same judge? No. I, uh, this was assigned to a different judge, but because it was a weekend uh, and uh, 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 it was assigned to uh, so th this judge, um, uh, Douglas Wogelock. Was the uh, Transit Authority uh, aware of the vulnerabilities in their system prior to the uh, August 5th meeting? And if so, could you give a timeline of the disclosure of the vulnerability to them? I think I have no comment on that. Right. I have a second. 
I have a second question, that kind of a follow-up. Um, is there any, any evidence that the Transit Authority is uh, taking any action against the manufacturer of the product to actually get the vulnerability fixed, as opposed to just suppressing the research? Um, well, one thing I, I, along those lines uh, that uh, is, is interesting is in the complaint, it, it, it says that it was a vendor who brought it to the attention of the, uh, of the Transit Authority, it does not name the vendor. Um, but uh, I think that the vendors should uh, definitely spend uh, uh, their time trying to fix security vulnerabilities uh, and focus on that uh, and focus less on trying to convince uh, security researchers not to uh, uh, look at their products and uh, talk about flaws. Thank you. First, thank you to the EFF for uh, your efforts in this. You're quite welcome. In the future, would it be possible to preempt a temporary restraining order by filing with the court to establish the author's right? There is a, uh, a feature in, in, in law called the uh, declaratory judgment. So when you have a, uh, a dispute with somebody uh, where it is a concrete enough dispute uh, that uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, is possible to then go to a court before you do something to get a, a court to declare the thing that you are about to do is legal or you could find out that it was illegal but you don't have to wait until you've done it and you're potentially liable. Um, but the situation has to be concrete enough to to have it, so uh, it's going to depend really on on the situation. If it's an idle question, uh, probably not. But if you are in a, uh, a dispute uh, with uh, a company about whether or not uh, something is releasable, um, and you may have the ability to get a declaratory judgment under certain circumstances. Hi, I, I was wondering um, to what extent you're also working with co-defendants, MIT, um, MIT President Susan Hockfield and MIT Chancellor Phil Clay? It's uh, my understanding that even though uh, uh, several of those uh, uh, people were named uh, on the motion papers, they were not actually named in the complaint. Uh, so I, I'm not sure why their names are on uh, the motion papers, but in terms of who the defendants listed in the complaint, uh, it is, uh, in addition to the undergraduate students, uh, MIT, the, uh, the institute was named. They had a separate counsel uh, who represented them at the, at the hearing. Um, we, we certainly were in conversations uh, with MIT's counsel uh, throughout this process, um, and uh, I, I think they were uh, uh, adequately represented. Since you won't allow your defendants to talk, what's the EFS uh, view on disclosure? I know that the, the MBTA thought they weren't given appropriate disclosure on this. Uh, from the EFS point of view, what sort of disclosure do you think is, is necessary? Well, it's going to depend on the circumstances of uh, a particular situation, but certainly as a, as a general rule, it is advisable to uh, contact uh, the people whose uh, uh, security uh, is at uh, issue, who have the vulnerability, uh, and uh, uh, do that uh, prior to the disclosure. And ideally, it would be something that where that uh, disclosure uh, or the, the, the vulnerability is something they could work on, on fixing. Um, and I can say that, you know, this um, efforts were made here to be in communication prior to this, uh, uh, prior to this uh, uh, lawsuit. Hi. You mentioned in your press statement that the Charlie ticket, which is essentially a magnetic storage medium, uh, the court found was actually a computer. I'm sorry. I, I, to be clear, that was not in the um, uh, court's order. The court didn't find that. That is something that the Transit Authority has uh, contended in its complaint. Uh, the court's order was about their uh, fair uh, system uh, as a whole. I, I can read the, the, the defined term. Was the the fair media system means the plaintiff system that meets the following two criteria: the system 
One is employed by the MBTA to manage, track, charge for, and collect fares, and two relies on the Charlie ticket passes and or Charlie card passes. I was wondering, though, if this were to become a permanent court precedent, um, what implications that would have for security researchers in the future? Um, well, I think that uh, uh, this case is a long way away from a ruling that uh, uh, RFIDs are, are computers um, under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but certainly uh, whether something is a protected computer uh, pursuant to that act is something that is very important to the security research community because you certainly uh, do not want to uh, be on the wrong side of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act if you can help it. Thank you. At the end of MIT's spring semester, about half of this attack was presented as a final project in a class taught by MIT professor Ron Rivest, who invented RSA encryption, along with SNA. Uh, half of this attack discussed the Charlie, car the Charlie ticket attack and explained how you could actually put arbitrary amounts of money onto a Charlie ticket. But this was presented at the end of MIT's spring semester months ago, and the, and the MBTA's complaint says they only found out about the attack on July 30th when a vendor told them. Are they lying, or did they really not figure this out for months and months? That would be an excellent question to ask the MBTA. <laughs> so, for instance, these folks didn't tell them? So I think that if you want to know what the MBTA was thinking, uh, it's a good question to ask them. As to uh, uh, anything which hits upon the um, information program codes or computer things that might somehow uh, be able to lead to somebody uh, uh, messing with the transit fare system, uh, we can't touch that. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. That, that concludes this portion of tonight's program. <laughs>very nice DEF CON folks asked me to add is that they are working right now on a fun way to, to fill that now empty slot. So uh, they'll keep you posted. I think there's one thing we'd like to say. We'd like to thank the EFF for all of their efforts, um, really for helping us. I don't know what we would have done these last 24 hours. Um, you know, we had a team of people helping us out, working all night long, um, you know, for us. And it's really been great. So thank you. Our, our pleasure. Very well. And, and, and thank you all out, out here for your support of EFF, which enables us to, to do this. Uh, and we love being here in this community. So thanks a lot to all of you as well. I think what Kurt meant to say is if you approve of the work that we're doing, uh, we only exist because we have a large membership that, uh, that uh, donates each year uh, and pays our salary so that we can stay up all night at DEF CON uh, helping people out. Uh, so uh, there's a booth over in the exhibition hall. If you haven't already joined the EFF, we encourage everyone to consider doing so. There's also a table at uh, Hackers with Guns where you can shoot at things and donate money to the EFF. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're just going to pause for just a couple minutes and switch gears a little bit and, and start on some of the stuff we were originally planning to talk about. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's get started again. Um, so, thanks for sticking around. We do have some other um, stuff that we want to chat with you guys about and tell you about and take your questions on. Um, so, and, and we'll also, of course, afterwards do the Ask EFF kind of Q&A um, at, at uh, I think, 3 o'clock, but we'll be in another room for that. Um, so, for right now, what I want to introduce my uh, colleague, Peter Eckersley. He's uh, our staff technologist. And he's going to talk to you a little bit about one of the other things we've been doing in the last year, which is keeping an eye on Comcast. 
And um, lots of people have been keeping an eye on Comcast. I'm sure many people in this audience have been keeping an eye on them because um, they were caught out uh, engaging in some unfortunate activity, um, throttling uh, BitTorrent streams. And um, they were caught out doing it, and just recently the FCC issued an order calling them to account for it. Um, and we have a few concerns about that order with not so much what the FCC is trying to accomplish, but whether the FCC has the regulatory authority to accomplish it. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit more in the Ask EFF panel, the nature of our concerns. But one of the things that we think either way is the best way to hold ISPs accountable if they're interfering with network traffic is to vote with your feet. Meaning, you got to hold them accountable, um, and if you don't like what your ISP is doing, you go somewhere else. But of course, how are you going to do that? You need the tools. You need to know what they're doing. And as we learned from the Comcast situation, um, which Peter will talk about a little bit more, uh, they don't always give you full disclosure. So um, we've come up with some tools to to work around that, and Peter's going to talk about them. Thanks. All right, thanks, Karen. Uh, can any, everyone hear me clearly if I'm talking here? Uh, put up your hands if you can't hear me. Okay. I guess I'll just lean over and talk like this. Uh, so EFF uh, is primarily a legal organization. We, we have a large team of attorneys and we do policy work. Uh, but there are also a couple of us computer scientists on staff at EFF. Uh, and sometimes we end up doing pure tech projects, uh, like the one that I'm about to talk about. Uh, so we see our, our, our role as, as combining all of these different skill sets and activities. So uh, Switzerland is the, uh, the piece of software I'm going to talk about today. It's a sort of peer-to-peer uh, system based on a client and a whole stack of uh, a whole bunch of clients talking to a single server, uh, and it's designed to test ISPs, uh, networks, and firewalls uh, to detect modifications or, or interference that they might uh, introduce into communications between clients on the internet. Uh, and so this talk is going to cover why we got into writing this piece of software, uh, what kind of testing facilities it offers, uh, and some technical details about how it works. Uh, the background is that during 2007, uh, some rumors started circulating that weird things were occurring on the network operated by Comcast, which is the United States' uh, second largest uh, consumer broadband ISP. Uh, and EFF ran some tests with a guy named Rob Topolsky, who was one of the first people who conjectured specifically that... Uh, uh, Comcast was injecting forged reset packets into certain uh, kinds of traffic. We ran some tests with Rob Topolsky uh, that c gave controlled evidence, the first controlled evidence that indeed Comcast was definitely responsible for the, uh, the forged reset packets that we were seeing on their network. I'm going to take this out. So uh, we ran those tests with BitTorrent and GNUtella, uh, and we ran them by hand using Wireshark, uh, to get a capture of some packets being sent over here, some packets being received over there. Well, hey, there are some reset packets being received that were never sent by the person that you were talking to. Uh, hey, that's, that's a sign of interference. But running those kinds of tests manually, just using packet sniffers and talking over a phone to coordinate them, turns out to be incredibly labor intensive. Uh, and you need to make sure that you're both turning on your packet sniffers at the right time, capturing the same period of traffic uh, and then ensuring that there is some BitTorrent or some GNUtella or some other protocol that you're trying to test uh, being exchanged between the two clients while the sniffers are running. Uh, and so this whole process, this whole methodology, uh, takes a long time to run. And we thought, well, hey, uh, we would really love to have better tools to run these kinds of tests, and they didn't exist, uh, so we set out to write some. But first, what we we're saying, as I, as I was uh, mentioning, you get Alice and Bob talking to each other. Uh, they're, they're using BitTorrent or GNUtella. And also briefly, there were reports that Lotus Notes and Windows Remote Desktop were being interfered with on Comcast's network. 
Uh, and the particular forged packets that we were seeing uh, were TCP reset packets, which are just ordinary TCP packets with a single bit in the header, the reset flag, turned on, uh, and they cause the client to die. Uh, or the connection to die, sorry. The, the client may or may not recover. Uh, if a particular TCP connection dies, it may retry it uh, at some point later, maybe straight away, maybe in 10 minutes, maybe in half an hour, maybe never. So the consequences for an application of having these reset packets injected into its communications are quite complicated and unpredictable. Uh, and what we saw in particular on Comcast network was interference that looked like it had been designed for BitTorrent uh, with the intention of preventing BitTorrent seeding uh, on Comcast network. But the consequences of that interference looked very different for Nutella, for example. And it seemed to us that perhaps Comcast or, or whoever they had purchased this system from uh, were just applying the reasoning that Nutella must be like BitTorrent uh, and not really understanding what the uh, results of their, their forged packets would be. Anyway, so we wrote code uh, to make these tests easier to run. Uh, there was a simple little program designed by a colleague of mine, Seth Schoen, uh, that was released in 2007 called PCAPDIF. And as the name suggests, it's a simple tool for taking two PCAP packet capture files and reporting the differences between them. Uh, so if you have a, a, a log captured over here with Alice and a log captured over there with Bob, it'll say, wait, there is a drop packet here and a, a modified packet here. But that doesn't answer the question of how you get those PCAP files in the first place. You still need to talk on the phone to someone, set up a test, uh, make sure you're running your packet sniffers at the same time, uh, and make sure there aren't any, any firewalls or other things in the way that are confusing your results. So Switzerland is a fancier design. It automates more of those steps of setting up a test environment, getting the packet sniffers running at the same time, uh, dealing with firewalls, and uh, I'll show you how it works uh, in the next few slides. But it's worth noting that both of these uh, pieces of software take a particular approach, which is to detect any kind of modification uh, or forgery of packets. Anything that's received uh, by Bob that was not sent by Alice will trigger an alarm. And that's different to some of the other tools that are out there, which, for instance, look at heuristics re relating specifically, say, to TCP reset packets. Because there are things you can look at about a TCP reset packet. Uh, for instance, is it part of a wave of, of packets that have uh, look like they're guessing sequence numbers to try and fool Bob into believing this is a real packet? Uh, or is the time to live in the TCP reset packet radically different from the other times to live that you see on other packets in this connection or in this flow? Uh, and, and so those kinds of heuristics, they, they work up to a point, and other people have used them successfully. Uh, but we're talking about a sort of more general tool that will work for other kinds of modification if, if other kinds of modification are being deployed uh, either by networks or by hackers. Um, uh, and perhaps other things that might get deployed in the future. So, so a general taxonomy of the kinds of software that can exist in this space to solve this problem. Uh, and I'll show you some, a table of other tools that are out there that, that fit in, in different places in this taxonomy. Uh, you can have active tools which generate traffic and then test to see whether it's interfered with, or passive tools that just look at existing traffic and, se and check for modifications. Um, and there are advantages to doing each of these things. Switzerland just happens to be passive. So it doesn't generate packets, it just looks at the packets that you're exchanging already. Uh, you can have testing software that is unilateral, so it's just something that you run on your computer that tries to figure out whether something weird is happening in a particular TCP connection, for instance. Uh, and that software is convenient because you don't need to coordinate with any other computer uh, but it's less powerful because you are always guessing uh, whether a particular thing that you're receiving is illegitimate. Uh, and th an example of this kind of unilateral stuff is a plugin that views the uh, BitTorrent client added for their software, uh, which just counted the number of reset packets that, that BitTorrent peers were collecting. Uh, and that produced some really misleading results uh, about particular ISPs, where you were seeing lots of TCP reset packets, but it turns out there are a whole lot of reasons why you can get them, and if they were actually sent by the other party, then they're not in any sense interference by an ISP. 
you can have 1.5 sided tests. Probably, maybe it's better to say you can have two sided tests, bilateral tests, where you're running software on both Alice, Alice's computer and Bob's computer, and there's some way that these two pieces of software coordinate. Uh, or you can have a 1.5 sided test where you, you have real, like a real algorithm running on one side and then some predictable behavior that you expect the other side to engage in. So maybe there's a server some, running somewhere and it, it's a, a fake BitTorrent client that will down, try to download a, a BitTorrent uh, file from you uh, and you know how it's going to behave but you don't know, uh, you don't actually have code running there inspecting its end of the flow. Um, and lastly, you can have multilateral uh, clients, which is what we've got with Switzerland, uh, basically bilateral, but with lots of people participating. Uh, next, you can, you can obviously focus down on one protocol. Uh, you can talk about BitTorrent, for example. And there, there is a great tool I'll talk about on the next slide that, that works pretty well for just BitTorrent interference. But it doesn't help you if you're wondering whether your Gnutella client is being messed with or some, if you're a developer and you're writing some new software and it's not working, uh, it's not going to tell you whether the network that you're on is hostile to your new code or whatever. Um, you can have different modes of deployment. Uh, JavaScript, some people have done JavaScript testing. There was, in fact, a talk on Friday using JavaScript testing of web page modification. Um, that's fine, but it's quite narrow in scope. You can have Java applets. A lot of people are putting these tests in browsers. Uh, and you can have standalone apps, which is what we've got here. And of course, you can do crazy things as well. So Dan Kaminsky has a tool uh, that he's talked about previously. Uh, it's not actually publicly available at the moment called uh, Inspector Packet that, that plays games in, in fooling an ISP and thinking, into thinking that you are talking to Google when, in fact, you're talking to a test server. Um, that's nice, but uh, it's not what we're doing with Switzerland. So here are the tools that are out there that we know about that you can just go and download today. Um, probably rather than getting into this uh, in a great deal of detail, uh, if you want to look at this, uh, there's a URL here, eff.org slash test your ISP, uh, and you can go and look at that table um, to find a tool that's useful to you if you want to run a test. But our tool is here, add a Switzerland on the end of that URL and you'll get our, our particular software. Sorry, my slides are running on a Mac that I've never used before, so they're jumping around. Um, uh, our tool is GPL'd. It's being developed at SourceForge. Uh, so you can get involved in development if you're interested. These slides are ah, the pause button, yes. Um, it's currently a command line application. Maybe in the future we'll put a GUI on it or a, a local host web server kind of interface, but at the moment it's just a command line tool. It's about as polished as Netstat. Uh, so if you can deal with Netstat as a, a, a network tool, then you probably can deal with Switzerland. On the other hand, if Netstat is perplexing to you, like it was to me at some point, then uh, maybe you should wait until we've released a few more versions uh, uh, and it'll make more sense. Currently all it does is spot modified and forged packets uh, and give PCAP logs of, of those packets to the user. Uh, so if uh, both the, the, the packets from your side and the packets from the other client side. Uh, so if you receive them a forged packet, it will give you a PCAP showing what your PS sent to you, what or tried to send to you. Um, so you can compare the two versions and figure out what was changed in between. It also counts drop packets and gives you some general metadata about what flows are going through your system. Uh, but the important piece of future work that we don't have yet is traffic shaping. So there are a bunch of ISPs that are not specifically forging or spoofing packets to mess with BitTorrent, say, but which are deliberately like throttling or slowing down how much traffic BitTorrent can send over a network in a, a fashion that you could call discriminatory in the sense that maybe uh, web traffic doesn't receive the same kinds of limitations. Uh, and so this is really interesting to test for, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, we're probably in a fairly good place uh, in design terms to do that, and I'll talk more about that in a couple of slides. But how do we spot these modified packets? Once again, my slides are running away. Um, imagine you have a bunch of clients, call them Alice and Bob and Charlie and Diane, and they're all like out there on the net, and they, they're all connected to the same Switzerland server in the middle. And we'll call this bunch of users a circle. Now. Each of the members of the circle is told about the IP addresses of all the other 
uh, clients in the circle. And so they run a little packet sniffer that's just tuned to collect packets from those other machines. Um, and whenever they see a flow, a flow is a, a combination of uh, IP addresses, ports, and protocol. Uh, whenever they see a new flow of, of traffic between uh, their, themselves and another member of their circle, they start sending summary information about that flow to the server. Uh, and the, the summaries are sufficient for the server to detect uh, at the injection of a spoofed packet or the modification of a, a, a genuinely sent packet and raise a flag. And when that happens, then the server goes back to the client and says, hey, wait a minute, this packet you sent or you received was modified. Uh, can you, can you uh, give me a copy of the actual packet? Uh, in future, we will probably add some privacy settings to, to enable users to only give the, the packet to the other party and not to the server. But at the moment, uh, a copy goes to the server. Um, and uh, the question that's interesting from a design point is, how do you efficiently do this summarization? How do you capture enough information about each packet that the server can tell if the packet was not legitimately sent? Uh, at the same time, you don't want to clog the, the link up by sending huge amounts of data. So how do you efficiently summarize your traffic? Uh, now, the obvious ways to do this, the most obvious way is also the least practical, which is to send an entire copy of all your packets to the server. Uh, and then, of course, the server can tell uh, if any of them were modified in flight, but you're adding a 200% overhead um, uh, to your, your traffic. Uh, and, of course, the privacy implications of doing that are not, not wonderful. So the, the obvious next thing that you turn to as a designer is a secure hash. What if I you know, feed each packet through MD5SUM or SHA1SUM? Uh, you still have a 27% traffic overhead there, uh, so that's not very good and you can do better. Uh, if you try to do better, say imagine you take the SHA1SUM of a packet and you just take the last couple of bytes. Um, that turns out to be insecure, of course, because someone who wants to, who, who sees you sending a particular packet and who wants to forge a packet or modify that packet can just brute force the, the SHA-1 sum, find an, an evil packet that has the same fragment of a SHA-1 sum uh, and send that in, in the place of the packet that you sent. Uh, but it turns out you can fix this problem. And the way you do that is to have your Alice and Bob and, and Charlie and Diane, all your clients, talking to the server over an encrypted link using OpenSSL, which, of course, we haven't actually implemented yet. So if, if you use the alpha version that's currently available, theoretically, an ISP could find some uh, sneaky way of modifying a packet and you not not spotting it. But we're figuring that we'll have this fixed before any ISPs bother doing that. Um, then the server sends to Alice and Bob and every pair of clients that are talking to each other. A key, uh, a random key, uh, that is used to, to switch. Instead of using a SHA-1 sum, you just use a, key, you use a keyed hash or an HMAC. Uh, and then that prevents the ISP from, or, or some other intermediary, from brute forcing your, uh, your weak hash because they can't see the, uh, the key because it's inside this TLS connection, and they can't see any of the targets for their brute forcing because all of the, uh, the summary information that you're sending is also encrypted in flight. Uh, so the only way that an adversary can do this is to, to try a whole lot of packets, and eventually, if they try 2 to the n, where n is the number of bits in your hash fragment, then they will successfully send something that fools you. But of course, they sent a whole lot of forged packets before they found that one magic forgery, uh, and you detected all of those forged packets that they sent first. Uh, so there isn't really a feasible way uh, to to attack this design, I don't think, at least not not through the crypto. Come on. Ah, right. I actually have no more slides, so I'm going to keep talking. I have a few more points to make. Um, it's important when you send these, these hash fragments to mask out parts of the packets. Uh, there are things that change all the time. For, exa for example, the time to live field inside a, an IP packet changes on every single hop, and the, uh, the, the header checksums change. Uh, and if you have a NAT firewall, then the sender IP changes to, to something that you should know about. Um, so before you 
calculate these, these hashes, you need to make some changes. You rewrite uh, the IP addresses in the ports according to what you know about the firewalls between these two machines. You zero out any fields that can reasonably change. And one of the hardest problems that we had to deal with uh, while building this system was uh, realizing how bad consumer NATs are, just the, the, the NAT firewalls that we all have in our homes doing wireless routing, routing duty, uh, those things by and large modify your packets in lots of strange ways that you might not have expected, or at least I didn't expect uh, in my naive uh, uh, new uh, uh, experience in this field. And the things that we saw being changed inside those packets were so extensive that you can't ignore them all. Uh, we saw do not fragment bits being changed. We saw uh, uh, MSS maximum segment size uh, fields being changed. We saw uh, ACK packets being retransmitted by routers uh, when the client had never retransmitted them themselves. We saw the fields inside ACK packets, like the actually acknowledgement number inside an ACK packet being increased by a NAT router. So your NAT router is acknowledging packets uh, that you have not received yet. Uh, and so you have this very large set of weird things that some firewalls do. And there isn't really any general purpose way of ignoring them because if you, for instance, ignore that last thing I described, if you ignore uh, forged ACK packets going out, then an adversary can drop a packet and then forge an ACK for that packet uh, and then your, your TCP connection is just going to sit around uh, waiting for this thing with Alice, the sender, thinking that it's been received and Bob, the receiver, never have, having received it uh, and if an adversary does this to your connections, they're going to flail horrifically. So uh, at the moment, our way of dealing with these NAT firewalls is basically just to report the modifications to the user. Uh, you'll get a notice saying, hey, someone's modifying your packets. It's, if there's a firewall in the path, it'll say, hey, it's probably your firewall uh, or the other peer's firewall that's doing the modification. Don't blame your ISP for this until you've removed the firewalls and run the test again. Um, but, uh, of course, that means that you have to manually go back and figure out that it was your firewall that's doing this. So perhaps at some point someone might build a big database of firewalls that you can fingerprint and know, oh, I have this model Linksys and it's known to do this kind of modification but not other kinds of modification. Perhaps at some point as a, as a big project you can uh, transparently ignore this kind of behavior. The other thing that we're planning to implement uh, but have not yet implemented in the current version is an algorithm that goes back once it's, once it's seen modification in a particular flow, uh, say it's seen the MSS field being changed, uh, and says, right, we reported to the user that MSS is being changed by someone in this particular flow. Uh, now let's start changing our hashing algorithm so that we mask out the MSS for future packets. And then if at some point down the line you get a forged reset packet, which modifies different fields inside the packet, uh, you're, you're going to still be able to spot that. Uh, but we haven't implemented that yet. Uh, so the, uh, the, the last thing that's worth noting is the, the way that you can run this, uh, use this software to run tests. As I said, it's a passive uh, system. So if you want to run tests, you can send any kind of traffic between Alice and Bob and, and Charlie and Diane, and it will be tested. But of course, you need to find someone else to, to run a test with. Uh, so we have an IRC channel that's, that's reasonably active, uh, that's just sprung up in the last week with people there posting links to, to torrent files and web servers and stuff that you can run tests with. Um, there's also a wiki page which we expect to have kind of a list of public services that are also Switzerland clients. Um, and so if you're, say, a, a VoIP developer and you want to know if your VoIP client is, is running okay, go and post a link to a public server there. Um, in the future, we may end up actually having some EFF server somewhere that runs a whole lot of test services and something in the client that actually does active tests <coughs> against those. Uh, but again, it's, it's further work rather than something we've got today. Uh, so I think those are the main points about design. Oh, the last thing, we want to do uh, traffic shaping detection. We want to see whether your ISP is messing with your VoIP connections, not by dropping or forging anything, but just by occasionally like one packet in 10 takes a second longer or 
10 milliseconds longer or some small amount of time longer to arrive at the, the destination, um, and therefore your, your VoIP call gets all jittery uh, and you, you hear static all the way through it or it falls apart because the reliability and the quality of service you're getting isn't good enough. Uh, so because we have Alice and Bob in place, uh, we have software on both of these machines. Uh, we have NTP. We, we kind of insist on on NTP running on the client, or at least NTP date, so that we can get an estimate of how accurate the clock is on each of these machines. Um, we can actually get up to the accuracy of your clock. We can we can get measures of latency for every single packet, uh, and then do statistics on that. So we're kind of excited to add that in the future, but uh, we don't have the code to do that stats yet. If anyone wants to work on it. Uh, we're an open source project and we'd love to have people hacking on this stuff too. Um, so I will just leave with the by reminding you all about the URL for this project. It's here uh, and you'll find links to the SourceForge project, the ISA channel, mailing list, everything on that page. Uh, so I'll probably take questions about this project here. Then I don't know how we're going for time, but we're, we're planning to do general EFF questions about all of EFF's work in the breakout room uh, after this session. Uh, I don't know what time it is at the moment. Why don't you go ahead and take questions and we may... Yeah, we, it looks like we actually probably have time to take questions here as well about general EFF stuff. So I'll take Switzerland questions first and then we can do all of EFF issues. I, I had a question. You're, you're actually recommending that people uh, turn off their home NAT routers for the purpose of using Switzerland? So we're not recommending that anyone in particular does anything on a particular network, but we're pointing out that if you want to run tests, uh, and at the moment this is really a testing tool for network engineers and protocol developers more than random home users. But if you want to run reliable tests and you want to be testing not your NAT firewall, but your ISP, then you have to get the NAT firewall I, out of the way. Okay, so you're not actually recommending that for home users because that, unfortunately in the popular press, Switzerland is being recommended for home users to test their ISPs. Right. So At the, some point in the future, ho we, we'd love to have Switzerland be reliable enough, uh, especially in terms of its response to NAT firewalls uh, and the weird things that they do, that we could get meaningful data from home users behind NAT firewalls, but at the moment, we don't think that's possible. Uh, there are other people who've talked about, for, there was a researcher who, who asked me about putting Switzerland on a NAT firewall itself. Um, and that would obviously be a great design if you can actually figure out a way of cramming our Python application onto a DDWRT router or porting it to C so it's, it's lean enough that it fits there. Um, you're in a good position there for a number of reasons, both uh, you get you don't have to worry about this modification stuff as a result of the firewall. You also get better data about quality of service because you don't have to worry about other flows from other clients behind the same NAT essentially creating noise in your data on, on how much traffic your IP address is, is running. So, And I'm going to leave you with a general uh, question for EFF and then stop hogging the mic. Um, last year there was a lot of discussion uh, about what the response was to the adjustments in FISA that a lot of people in the, in the federal administration wanted. And I just I would have loved to have heard a little follow up on that uh, fairly important to uh, topic. Uh, sorry, I didn't cut the adjustments in what? Sorry. Oh, I should hand this uh, to Kurt. I, I, get, I got one right here. Uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, we, we usually call it uh, FISA. Uh, so uh, what the question is about is uh, uh, well. There have been a number of changes to, to FISA uh, that were uh, passed into law uh, just this uh, past uh, July. Um, one of the issues that was very uh, disappointing to us was that uh, it included a package of telecom immunity legislation that was designed to ensure the uh, telecommunications companies uh, wouldn't have to face the music with respect to our, our lawsuit. Um, we are continuing to fight that. Uh, we uh, believe that is an unconstitutional law and we'll be uh, fighting that in the courts. Uh, at the same time, the uh, FISA Amendments Act uh, also uh, uh, revamped uh, surveillance laws in a way designed to make it much easier for the government to spy on you. Uh, and uh, it is very disappointing that this, uh, this law passed. Any more questions? Yeah. 
A uh, couple, a uh, couple of questions. First, uh, thanks to you guys. You guys mean business. I mean, you guys are the EFF lawyers, and you guys are doing very technical things. This is cool. Thank you. Outstanding. All right. Uh, one thing. Uh, okay, so the Switzerland servers um, used it very quickly before coming to DEFCON, and was like, wow, neat. Uh, the remote servers that you guys are running, data retention? Are you guys keeping packet logs? And then, then how does that get into? I mean, this is obviously a developer tool right now. Right. So. so we haven't written uh, policy on our data retention, but the plan is probably to do something like about two weeks of data retention on our server, mm -hmm. uh, which gives us a reasonable window if someone says, hey, uh, we saw some interference here. Um, right. Uh, can you go and have a look at what the server recorded during that, that session? Uh, uh, it gives us time to follow up on it, mm -hmm. uh, but it means that we're not a huge target for subpoenas. Right. Um, and most of the logs that you get on the server, I should go into some more detail about this. Uh, with the current design, most of the logs that you get on the server are just about flows. So they're flow metadata logs. Uh, just there was a connection between uh, port A and port B between these two machines. There were, you know, 3,000 packets sent between them. Uh, so that kind of flow metadata uh, is revealing, but it's not as bad as, as tra communications contents. Uh, we also keep contents of some packets in very special cases. And the special cases are when Switzerland reported interference in a particular flow, uh, the current code grabs nine packets uh, three random, like often the inf interference will be a whole wave of packets being modified at once. So we select three of those, those occurrences of modified packets and we grab a, the modified packet and a packet on either side effectively, give or take. Um, and so we have this tiny little record of, of actual content of communications during interference. Um, and I guess the important point that we're, we're trying to hammer home with the client is uh, if those contents of communications are, are confidential, then you shouldn't be running the client um, uh, on that machine that, that is exchanging confidential information. Uh, it's still it's a very small amount of traffic, but there is a slim danger that something sensitive could be in there, uh, and we, we want users to consent to that when they're uh, running the, uh, the client on their machine. Cool. Okay, uh, second question. The the kind of the Switzerland model and the tools, I saw that this was uh, written in Python. Great, that's palpable. Uh, is there any thought given to making this a more generalized framework for network testing beyond just the, the uh, how can I put it, instead of just checking for the, the packets, doing more sophisticated things with capturing packets on both ends? So the first thing, obviously the statistics stuff that I was mentioning before uh, is a general network testing uh, of general network testing interest in the sense that if you want to know how good the link that you just built between two buildings or between two cities or something yeah. is, then you can run these clients and uh, probably there's a bit of engineering to do, but you'll get some, some nice latency and jitter statistics if we build that statistics engine. I believe, so, I believe you could get support from people working on TCP stacks as well. Uh, operating systems. Yes, that's true. So th there's a whole separate issue about whether you can get uh, particular instrumentation uh, data out like TCP stacks internally know a whole lot of stuff about uh, the state of your connections. For instance, uh, all the backoff algorithms that's, that that are the mechanism by which ISPs normally shape traffic. You know the way they shape traffic is by dropping a few packets. Um, they trigger a response in your the TCP code on your machine saying, "Hey, wait, we're not getting all of our packets. We're, we're losing some packets here. Let's slow down a bit and figure out what speed we can." reliably transmit data at. Uh, and so inside the kernel of your operating system, this data is available, but there isn't generally a way to get it out. Uh, and my understanding is, and, uh, like, I'm fairly new to network testing in the sense that until this Comcast stuff started being on EFF's radar, I hadn't gotten my hands dirty with network testing like this. But my understanding from people who've been working in this field for longer is you can do that, but you need to replace the TCP stack inside your kernel. And some people do that. There's a, um, a project called Net1000, I think. It's in this table that actually, uh, NDT. Um, so there are the, these uh, speed test tools that actually use <laughs> instrumented TCP stacks to get more information about what your kernel knows about your network state. Uh, and it'll be an interesting future project to try and get some of that data into Switzerland. 
Cool. And the last question, uh, quickly, uh, ha ha traffic shaping considerations. So uh, when you guys are talking about wanting to get towards measuring traffic shaping, how are you guys going about it? Or is that something that maybe should be dealt with out of the room? So, so we don't have a design yet, but the general yeah. idea would be add... Um, the first thing I'd say is we need to probably add to every, the summary information we send to the server a little bit of extra information about the timestamp for that packet. At the moment, what we're doing is we send a whole batch of packets at once, and we just send a general timestamp saying, this is the newest packet in this whole batch. And that's obviously less data to send. So what we would need is an efficient compression of the timestamp, uh, which you can get. Uh, so you, you do something like you say, look, this batch contains packets with timestamps between this time here, T0, and this time here, T1. Uh, and then you do some Huffman encoding or some other encoding of the timestamps for every single packet so that you don't need to send like a high precision floating point number uh, as the timestamp for every uh, last packet in the, in the batch. Uh, and so once you have that compression algorithm, maybe you can get away with, I actually haven't done the numbers on this properly, but I think probably a couple of bytes will, will give you uh, a timestamp that's as accurate as your system clock. Uh, and then once you've done that, the server can do some calculations saying, okay, for every packet that is cancelled out, like we've, it's sent by Alice, received by Bob, you calculate how long it was in flight, um, you have that, add that to an average latency for the link, and then you do some statistics on the outlying uh, things to get jitter. Yeah, do you want to... No, <laughs> ask the follow-up. Grab the mic. Uh, no, no, no. All right. Or well, afterwards. Uh, have you thought about uh, control channel detection from the ISP's perspective? For example, Comcast could, uh, you know, see, hey, this guy's talking to a, uh, a Switzerland server. Let's turn off the evil bit. Right. So whitelisting is definitely an issue here. Uh, the first solution that we had to this con conceptually was, uh, what about maybe... Um, uh, grab another wireless network from another ISP, send your connection to your Switzerland server over that link and your real test data over the first link. Alternately, you can perhaps use Tor to connect to the Switzerland server for the control channel uh, and your regular like non-overlay connection to, to test the data. Uh, at the moment, we have a message in the Switzerland protocol that allows a client to announce that its public IP address is something other than the IP address it's connecting from. And that message is disabled because it, it has security implications that we haven't quite thought through. Um, probably, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that there is a way of adding that feature without creating a risk that someone else will find a way to use it to, to learn something about your traffic when you're not a Switzerland client. Um, or, or when you're a Switzerland client and like they're another Switzerland client, maybe they can run some tests to check certain things about your connection. And there's some, some subtle stuff there. So probably the, the way this will happen at first would be someone runs a special Switzerland server that has that feature enabled where clients can log in through Tor and just say, hey, I'm at this IP address blah on Cox's network. Just trust me that I'm there. Um, and that server makes sure that it won't leak private information about people who are totally unconnected to Switzerland. Um, but that's a research project still for us. Okay, thanks. And um, actually, uh, one thing that I was thinking of, just as, as food for thought, you know, you're going to be intro introducing um, uh, SSL uh, for the control channel uh, yeah. in the near future, correct? Um, maybe something like um, XML RPC over HTTPS to make it, you know, look as much like normal HTTPS traffic as possible. Right. That's Actually, right. that's a good point. So the other way you can defend against this is obviously the control channel problem is hardest when it's a, like switzerland.eff.org. It's a publicly known server with a publicly known port. It's very easy to whitelist. Um, if we use SSL, we have to make the, the actual traffic fingerprint proof uh, so that the you know, it looks like any other HTTPS connection, and, and that's a, a good strategy. I have a, I have a general uh, EFF uh, question, maybe for the attorneys. Sure. Um, over the past uh, year, uh, since last DEF CON, uh, we saw a couple instances um, uh, where uh, lawsuits targeted um, uh, D DNS uh, 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 providers. Um, so that was that was WikiLeaks, and then there was a Dutch MP 
that they had a controversial movie and uh, what happened was like servers would be overseas so they're outside the jurisdictional reach of whoever wanted to take down the servers so what they did was they went after the um, the domain name uh, f fill that one in for me. What, what am I? So, so if you uh, can't get a legal authority or, or a court to order a server to be shut down, but you you can order their domain name registrar, the registrar to disable the, the, registrar, yeah. the, uh, the domain name, then uh, that's an easy way to take down a site. Right. Um, if if the law actually allows that process, and Kurt, I think will comment further on. So, whether so it is does. there is there a jurisdiction that would be better to have uh, your registrar in? Uh, as opposed to another jurisdiction as a way of avoiding those takedowns? That's my general question. Uh, so we were involved in the, the WikiLeaks situation, uh, and that was a situation in which uh, initially a uh, court gave a very erroneous um, uh, court order. Uh, and then we got involved. Uh, a lot of other people got involved. And I would say that one, one of the things is it's not so much that the U.S. law was the problem. The court misapplied the law. And then when the uh, uh, court uh, misapplication of the law was uh, brought to its attention, uh, uh, the, the injunction was lifted, the order was taken down, uh, such that or the order was removed such that the DNS uh, uh, did not have to uh, stop directing traffic to uh, WikiLeaks. But this is something that can happen when uh, courts uh, are uh, having a rushed uh, judgment and uh, presented with uh, 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 an, uh, perhaps not a full understanding. Um, so really having a DNS provider with backbone uh, is, is really uh, a good way. Um, it was unfortunate that the DNS provider in that uh, instance did not raise some of uh, what ultimately turned out to be some meritorious uh, issues, uh, preferring it instead to just uh, resolve the matter. Uh, so look, look for backbone. Yep. It's not Switzerland. Uh, mine's a question about when you fly overseas and back uh, and you have thumb drives, laptops, um, hearing impaired devices that store inf data information and they have, they're allowed to investigate them and there's no timetable um, for them to return them. How they keep track of that they're not ending up with somebody, your Mac Air is not ending up with somebody's Christmas toy. Because there's, for what I've seen, they can keep them and hold them forever. So uh, border search is something that we have been very much uh, interested in, uh, uh, looking at this issue from a number of, of levels, uh, trying to use the Freedom of Information Act to find out more about what's uh, going on, um, uh, looking very closely at the court cases. Um, so it's the TSA's position, and well, sorry, the Border uh, Patrol's uh, uh, position, that when you come from overseas, uh, that they can search uh, your laptop uh, just as they could search uh, anything else. Uh, they haven't, uh, or they, they have affirmatively not taken the position that a U.S. citizen can be prevented from coming into the country if they don't um, allow the search. Oh, I should say, an issue uh, that uh, at this point appears to be uh, uh, not very commonplace, but I can imagine it becoming so, is what if your material is encrypted and you're not interested in handing over the password? Uh, and so, as I understand their position on that, is then they will take the device and try and uh, break your <laughs> break your crypto and take as long as they feel is necessary to uh, to do so. Uh, so if you uh, uh, want to uh, travel with information across uh, the borders, uh, either you, you have a lot of faith in your crypto's ability to withstand an unlimited amount of time of government uh, attack or uh, not have it on your, on your computer and perhaps uh, transmit it uh, in a secure uh, method uh, uh, when, when you're not uh, at the border. Follow up on the uh, laptop and border discussion. So I appreciate your uh, EFF's testimony for Senator Feingold. And surprisingly, the minority party was, was fairly tepid and it seemed relatively flat in terms of saying that they wanted a fair standard applied. I'm curious, are you aware of any legislation? Then to follow up on the uh, breaking the encryption, would that constitute a DMCA violation? 
I, yeah. Uh, I don't think you, you, you'd be able to uh, uh, prevent them from looking at your uh, encrypted material by trying to assert the DMCA. Uh, but, uh, 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 and as far as the legislation, um, I, I, this is not uh, uh, my issue. I've been looking to some aspects of this, but the, the Fourth Amendment privacy issues, uh, but uh, I have not been looking into the legislative things. Uh, earlier you mentioned having a provider with backbone is a good defense. Do you guys have a list of good versus bad providers? And well, uh, would you make one? one? One thing we've actually really tried not to do is do EFF endorses. Um, some of you may know that, that EFF was involved in the creation of the trustee system where you could get the trustee seal uh, if you had a privacy policy. Um, and it turned out that the trustee system uh, was not really a particularly good way for people to decide whether or not to, to trust somebody. And that has made us very reticent to uh, get, get further involved in, in uh, saying a particular company. So let's say you know we, some company came to us and said, oh, we're the bestest and we will have backbone. And we think, oh, yeah, you really are. And then we endorse them and then they change their mind and they do something else. So we have to start auditing them. And then pretty soon we have a whole like EFF auditing division, and that's not. Um, what about rather than auditing, just have a list of companies that have been caught doing immoral Com or companies that things. don't get caught? No, companies that you know have 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 a list saying these companies have been caught doing X Y Z. These companies have not been caught yet. Factual link to the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, you you know. Uh, uh, whether someone's been caught yet is not necessarily the, the, the strongest correlation as to whether or not they're, they're doing bad things. <laughs> it's a nice shopping tool, though. One fairly pragmatic observation about the WikiLeaks case is that WikiLeaks had several domain names uh, registered with different registrars in different countries, uh, and that kept people finding uh, their site at wikileaks.be while uh, wikileaks.org was down. Uh, so that's a pragmatic strategy you can take to make yourself safer from that particular means of takedown. Um, I have a follow-up question to the border security stuff before. What happens if I have a file full of junk, about three gigabytes or so? Now, random data looks like good crypto, right? Sure. You know, so... I have this file full of random data. I come into the country. They say, oh, what's this? It's random data. We want your keys. It looks like crypto. It's random data. And it is random data. And they take my laptop. Can I call you guys? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it looks like we're, we're, we're running low on time. We're going to do the Q&A. Oh, hold on. I, I'm going to get to that. Please. I, what I was going to transition with is I believe that uh, uh, Marsha Hoffman, who is the attorney who is focused most on border search issues, is, I, I hope, going to be available in our Q&A session in, in the smaller room. And um, uh, border search issues would be best directed to them. Um, you know, but if you're ever in, in trouble, please call the EFF. Uh, if you want to make trouble... I didn't make trouble. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, one of the things that, that we are going to be talking about in a bit is, is how how to get a case that, that is going to help, uh, uh, help us help you. And I think that's something that Eva is going to be speaking to. Um, do you want to say anything now or, or take it at the Q&A? Um, sure. If you come to the talk at the breakout room, I will take the time to explain how we decide to take a case, uh, what we do with cases that are interesting to us uh, but that we cannot take on because there's only 30 of us, uh, and also what sort of things not to bring to me, ever. <laughs> um, one last question before we move over to the breakout room. Uh, going back to Comcast, not Switzerland in particular, but is the EFS problem with what Comcast was doing or the ham-handed way they went about it? I think there are a bunch of different ways that you have to split up that question. Uh, so 
we have degrees of concern about different things that ISPs can do. Uh, Comcast's particular uh, kind of interference uh, was really troubling because if you're an application developer, uh, say a startup company or some kid in a dorm room somewhere writing a new application and it just so happens that your, your new software trips over some uh, interference algorithm that ISPs are deploying somewhere, uh, then you're going to need to find a way to get the ISP to change that behavior, or you're going to need to understand what it is and figure out how you can avoid triggering it. Uh, and if you imagine a world where there are dozens or hundreds of ISPs around the planet, and they're all running around building these kinds of systems for interference, suddenly it starts to seem that the only people who could get a new protocol to run reliably out on the internet would be huge companies that would have the resources to either engineer their way around every weird thing that an ISP is doing to them or go and negotiate with every ISP on the planet to make sure that their traffic is carried correctly. Uh, so there are really serious policy problems with this kind of interference. Uh, if you're talking about uh, discrimination that's maybe just b about bandwidth. So web applications get you know, the full capacity of the channel, but peer-to-peer -peer applications only get up to a third of it, say. And some ISPs in Canada, for instance, uh, have started to, to deploy that kind of traffic shaping uh, on their networks. Uh, now there you have some concerns that are perhaps less spectacular in the sense that, well, it isn't going to completely prevent applications from seeing the light of day, but it raises serious competitive questions about whether ISPs are placing themselves in, in the position of uh, picking winners about which applications will be allowed to, to function best on tomorrow's networks. Uh, and again, uh, we think it would be much wiser for an ISP to solve its traffic management problems uh, in a way that doesn't look at what application it is that's sending the traffic. Uh, so I guess I'm admitting that on cable networks, for instance, you do have problems with congestion. Uh, it's true that BitTorrent can, a whole stack of BitTorrent clients seeding and, and exchanging large files on the same street uh, could bring one of Comcast's uh, uh, cable loops to its knees if they didn't do some kind of general purpose traffic shaping there. Uh, but what we think they should probably do is figure out in real time, okay, each application it ha can afford, we can afford to give each application 50 kilobytes per second right now, so let's let them all have that much. Um, and then these IP addresses over here seem to have been sending a lot of data, not just for the last minute, but for the last three hours. So let's, you know, put them in a category of like long-term data transfer IP addresses and give a bit more bandwidth to someone who's just fired up a YouTube video download, not because it's a YouTube video download or it's web traffic, but because it's a new connection that's sending data all of a sudden, uh, and you're deprioritizing stuff that's been transferring for the last three hours. And we think that that makes more sense from a policy point of view, and also probably more sense from an ISP's point of view, in the sense that if they try to mess with BitTorrent like this, BitTorrent is just going to go and find a way to sidestep all of the interference. Um, and sometimes that sidestepping will be evading detection. Sometimes it will be irresponsible stuff like, OK, let's just ignore reset packets. And suddenly the internet gets more broken. Um, uh, so it, it's probably in the interest of ISPs to, to look for uh, more neutral ways of achieving their network management objectives anyway. Uh, I mean, there are conspiracy or, or kind of competition arguments that some people have raised. Some people have said, hey, Comcast is messing with BitTorrent because they're afraid that it's a video distribution mechanism that threatens their cable marketplace. Um, and those are like, pretend, like really complicated legal questions and, and antitrust questions that, that may be like, valid questions to ask, but uh, they're really hard to answer. So well, I'll view... As a, as a comment, I mean, I can say I worked for another large cable operator for several years, and that question never once came up. I mean, that's not the consideration at all. Right, and, and one hopes that it isn't, but you get this 
it, it's easy to, to make that allegation against a cable company when they are seen doing this kind of thing. So our advice to the cable companies would be, don't put yourself in a position where someone can make that allegation to you. Be transparent about what you're doing on your network. Say, we're shaping it, we're shaping traffic, here's our algorithm. Um, if, if you have problems with it, like, uh, you know, technical detailed problems like your application's being broken by it, come and like talk to our engineers over here um, and just be out there and upfront about what you're doing. Uh, and in the meantime, I guess, where our approach is, let's shed light on what networks are doing. Because in Comcast's case, when we went and spoke to them, they flat out denied doing this uh, for weeks after we'd been running tests and seeing uh, these forged reset packets. You know, we were talking to senior Comcast lawyers and they just said, we don't uh, interfere with any application on our network. Uh, so, yeah, our message would be ISP should be transparent and think carefully about how they manage traffic and we're going to try and write tools and inform the public and give people a way to test whether ISP's claims are correct or not. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, Remember to come and join EFF at the uh, EFF table over in the exhibit room. And we are now going to go to a breakout room. Can someone tell me the number of that room? Three. 103? No, no. no. Breakout the room number three oh, breakout conjunction room. with uh, track three. All right. Breakout room number three over the hall somewhere. Uh, and we we'll have plenty of other interesting things to talk about. We can talk about national security letters. We can talk about fair use. We can talk about uh, other IP issues. And so we encourage you all to come by uh, to uh, catch up uh, over in the breakout room. Thank you very much.